Okay. So, um, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou koutou. I'm so excited to be um, able to present at this um, symposium and to see how um, how it's grow, how Student Voice Australia has grown from humble beginnings to um, to being so strong. It's really exciting. I'm also really excited to have Sarah joining me in this presentation. Um, we, we did a presentation before and um, a webinar, and it was so good to work with Sarah, who has a wealth of experience and insights and knowledge. She is, um, she, Sarah started, what were we wearing? What were you wearing? Um, whose badge back, is up there? And she is a law student at um, University of Newcastle. And I'm sure, do, do we have all the bios somewhere else for everybody? No? Don't know. Anyway, um, okay, so to go, how long do we have, Lisa, now? I'm going to say that just do your presentation. We just may not have time for questions. Yeah. We'll just keep it in the chat. That's fine. Anyone that who knows me will know that I find it really hard once I start talking in my absolute pet area, which is student voice, as you would know, um, to, to stop talking, but I will try very hard and I'm hoping Sarah will do most of the talking anyway, because <laughs> she's the person who we want to listen to most. So partnering with students to better prevent and respond to sexual assault and sexual harassment. There is no area which is more important for student boys every year, every area, every facet of the sector's operations are huge, hugely important to include student voices we've been talking about. But um, this area is um, can be no more important. So um, actualizing the student voice to partnership, there's a lot of talk about engaging student voice in this area, as with all other areas, but how do you actually make it real, um, make it authentic and, um, and effective? Um, so applying the, the partnership principles that we developed, the step up principles, which are still um, the principles for student voice um, generally, applying those in this context, the, um, the questions that we have to ask are why. I think why we don't really need to answer that question, but it's, it seems so obvious to us. Students are at the centre of, um, of life on the campuses. They're out there in the campus, in the halls, in um, everywhere in the university, they're the experts. So it's, it's patently obvious, it seems, that their voices are at the centre of everything we do in this area. Um, whose voices and how way we find them are the big questions that Sarah has, is going to talk about a lot, I think, I hope. Um, and how do we authentically and effectively engage this diverse range of voices? The quiet voices, which is part of the theme of this conference. It was interesting too listening to the keynote speaker this morning, Lucy, talking about power, because I think that that is a really key, key thing to be addressed in this area. And we will talk about that a little bit more. So the idea of this session, we want it to be essentially practical. What Sarah and I did, well, Sarah has all the knowledge and experience anyway, but what I did was I just went before I did the webinar, I I went around my network and that I developed through Student Voice Australia and the overseas networks as well and just found out what everybody is doing in this area. So we just sort of put together a whole lot of initiatives, ideas, and whatever that, that hopefully you can pick up because you'll have the slides. You can, there's a lot of stuff on the slides that we probably won't have time to go through, but you can pick it up. So what I see here is, um, there's two areas really that we're talking about. One is the action, which is listening and hearing to student, listening to student voices and actually hearing student voices and responding when students speak up, when students um, complain or, or report incidents of sexual harassment or sexual assault. How do we actually listen? There's um, one, one, of the, one of the people I talked to was um, a person at York University, Sarah Ball, who talked about listening while silencing in this area. One of the experiences that they came across was a lot when students 
um, report or complain about incidents of student harassment or student or, or sexual harassment, sorry, or sexual assault, um, they, they, nothing goes any further, basically. They're assured that it is going to, but then it, they're basically silenced. Um, so how do you make sure that you actually hear and respond when students speak up? Um, and the other area is proaction, which is engaging student voice holistically towards changing cultures at an institutional level. Um, one thing that I always say is that, to me, um, my view in this area is, um, is that working towards meaningful and meaningfully engaging the voices of students in this area should be thought of by everybody, but particularly by, um, by providers, by institutions, as not as a problem to be dealt with, but as an opportunity to create an affirming, supportive, inclusive, cohesive, and safe institution. And I think that needs to be sort of uppermost in everyone's mind, who's, everyone who is working in universities in this area. So, a common understanding of what partnering with students means here. I did actually have notes on my um, on my um, PowerPoint, but I seem to have lost lost them as I'm doing this. But never mind. I will just go with what I've got here. Um, so, what is needed for student boys to be engaged authentically and really effectively in this area is a common understanding of what partnering with students means a genuine commitment on both sides to collaborating, real action on the part of the institution that students can see, finding ways to draw on and engage your voices, embracing the voices of survivors, and training and guidance. And we'll come back to training and guidance, but I'm actually going to hand over to Sarah now to talk to this area. Hello, thank you for having me. Um, oh, firstly, I want to obviously acknowledge um, the traditional owners of the land that we're all coming from. I'm coming from a Wabakul land in Australia um, and, and a Wabakul myself. Um, I want to just pay respects to elders past and present um, and anyone listening that is First Nations as well. Um, yeah, it's a really interesting topic and I'm very privileged obviously to be here speaking. Um, I've done quite a lot of work within sexual assault and harassment on campus, um, particularly with um, the University of Newcastle, a few others, but um, talking about things like our lived experience um, and how important it is that people with lived experience, students with lived experience, are the ones that are being consulted, um, engaged with when it comes to anything to do with um, improving sexual assault and harassment on campus. And I think that there's quite a multitude of ways that you can do it. And I'm sure we'll get into that in a bit, but it starts all the way from open week, um, from O week. And it can continue these conversations through breaks, uh, mid-semester breaks, um, during the long breaks as well. Um, but there's always something we can do to contribute to ending sexual assault and harassment on campus. Um, and I guess we'll get into a few more specific ideas as we go on. I think um, Sarah, Sarah has very good ideas too about very strong ideas about using using student leaders and other student reps on campuses, but also using student clubs and um, working through students to find the ways to draw and engage all the voices, the voices that would normally, as with the theme of today, remain silent and quiet. Okay. Um, we're going to come back to training and guidance. So how do we do this? Um, so what we did, as I said, is we went around networks, and what well, I did, went around networks and talked to um, to institutions in Australia and in New Zealand about what um, how what they did, how they brought it out, and the, the most important thing is to have it out in the open from day one, showcase that orientation, the importance, the university places, and working with on, in partnership with students generally, but in this area that we're focusing on. Um, 
demonstrating a clear focus on an environment free from assault and sexual harassment and highlighting the role of student voice in this um, and letting students know they can contribute to this place. Um, applying time and resources, which is really important. I find that quite often in my life in, um, in the university, I was previously at UTS when I began Student Voice Australia and you know, UTS in Sydney, masquerading as an Australian. Um, one of the things I always thought was when, the, when processes were being developed, in new areas, um, universities had this huge inclination to go outside to get um, to get consultants and whatever. And my line was always: you have the experts, you have the voices within. So it's it's a matter of applying time to finding back to that point that we were making before, applying uh, finding those voices and applying resources to those voices to making sure that those voices within are effective. Um, developing connection and means of communication. Communication is hugely important, and Sarah will talk about this, I hope, in a minute. Um, communication and transparency is hugely important. Um, Sarah, would you like to pick up on that? Um, yeah, it's, it's the most important thing because if, as an institution, you're not, you need to be trustworthy to students, particularly in this space. Um, and people with lived experience are vulnerable and want to be able to trust their institutions that um, they are doing the right thing. I think, yeah, it's really important. But I think um, another thing I wanted to add on this is a lot of the time there isn't many people advocating in this space as students. Um, but it's also important that we get the more quieter people to be advocating in the space as well. And we found a really um, awesome way of being able to do that is talking to clubs and student societies um, within your institution um, and, and, you know, starting to train them and starting to give them that understanding of sexual assault on campus um, and allowing them to contribute and continue on those conversations within their student um like community groups and we found that that is that's really important because students are going to trust the people that they trust so um cultural and ethnic groups religions a whole range of different things they'll trust the people who are the leaders of their clubs so if the leaders of their clubs or the executives are the ones that are passing on this information it's going to be more trusted from them rather than potentially a newsletter that's sent out that most people might not see. So it's really important that we start with the people who have that really important impact, um, which can be executives and people running clubs. Um, and also from day one at O-Week as well, I found that a lot of institutions would try and, I guess, not want to bring awareness to consent, respectful relationships, sexual assault and harassment, because they thought that if they bring awareness to it, then it will mean that it's happening. Um, and what we have found with every institution we have worked with is when they actually have information, education on sexual assault and harassment, it's actually making students feel so much more safer because they feel like their institution is actually actively working to do something um, to see an end to it. So we find that that's really important that, you know, from day one that we are supplying that education, but we're also doing it in ways that people with lived experience, you know, get to have a seat at the table, they get to have a voice, but also that we're engaging with people who might not put their hand up for a whole range of different, um, yeah, positions. Great, thank you, Sarah. Um, so what um, what do some institutions actually do? It's a really good point that Sarah made about, um, some institutions being, or some providers being a bit loath to bring that out at the beginning, but it seems that there are, uh, there is a lot more of a move to um, to acknowledge that it is that it is happening in all providers. I mean, the, the reports that have been done, there's just, there was one recently, um, show huge incidents of sexual harassment and sexual assault on, um, on university or on provider campuses. And I think it's important to recognize that rather than to try and to, uh, 
hide it under a blanket, to recognise it and deal with it. So um, one of the things, one of the things that we came across was was actually from my university, UTS, which was um, pop-up stalls at campus events and fun days, posters with provocation questions. Am I, I have a bit of a problem here because I find that I'm blocking out half of my screen. Am I, I'm not doing that there? No, okay, that's good. That's good, it's a bit disconcerting. Okay. Um, so pop-up stalls, um, posters with provocation questions like, what do you think is sexual assault, sexual harassment? Ask them to put crosses against a range of scenarios. How do you see students can engage in addressing these issues? How would you like to engage? What would encourage you to engage? And what do you see your engagement would look like? Um, I think Sarah talked about court boards on, um, on at these events. So at all events on campus and fun days from orientation onwards, um, court boards where students can leave messages and make suggestions. Do you have anything more to add? To yeah, this? I think that it's really important um, when you're trying to engage your institution with this kind of advocacy and work that you also have anonymous options for people to contribute. Um, so you've got your people who are going to put your hand up for the roles and then you've got your people who um, can be easily convinced or will come along with education. But then you've also got people, particularly with a lived experience, who might really want to contribute but either are not in a safe place to do so um, or for any reasons just want to be anonymous. So it's really important that it could be like a feedback link or a survey or um, something we do time to time is we'll just leave a cork board somewhere where there's some pins and some sticky notes and you can go leave a response to whatever question that may be there anonymously. Um, that's a really important way to be able to do stuff as well because um, sometimes people will be unsafe um, because, you know, because of cultural reasons, a whole range of different reasons, um, but it doesn't mean that they still shouldn't be able to, you know, contribute to this kind of work. Thank you, Sarah. So to move on to a hugely important thing, important point, which is of engaging students in this area to work with students um, in, in, real, in real terms and effective terms, is training and guidance. So I think that it's really important. And I think students um, have a role to work with their, um, from the beginning with their, with their providers to push for, for much better training and guidance that actually seems to be provided these days, but to work with them to ensure that students actually are able to provide, are in a position to provide their voice in a way that is effective and works. So a commitment to training of not only students, of course, but staff with input from a diverse range of student groups. The diverse range of student groups is really important into the training and guidance, because obviously there are so many different, um, dem the demographics and providers these days have so many different groups that we've talked about today before that um, Lucy talked about. And so it's important that there is input from the, those diverse range of student groups into the training and guidance. Collaboration to develop the means of training which works best for all people from those diverse groups. The means to work with students from the beginning on how the training should be done, when, where, and ways that affect, that ways that are most effective for students. Um, encouraging students to run campaigns and advocate for change in specific areas where they see a need, um, for example, in sports clubs. Would you like to pick that up, Sarah, or you? I think I, yeah, I think I sort of covered it before, but it's just like, um, you know, I think with the training, it's really important that because any teacher in any class, anyone that you're comfortable with as a student, you might go and disclose to. And if they, and we need our staff um, but also our executives as well, so like um, our club leaders to also be trained um, in things like understanding sexual assault and harassment because they need to know how to um, take disclosures but also what to do because you don't want to give the wrong um, 
advice um but also yeah i think it's there's just a whole range of ways that we can do it but they definitely as that bottom point says needs to be um anonymous options um so that everyone can have a say um in this space and also thank you sir and also important to work with students to use i said times and places and how training is going to be conducted but also on using appropriate languages Mm. and cultural norms for that training. It's very important to work with students from the beginning to um, to establish those, um, that those processes are, comply with um, everybody's, the diverse range of students. So, um, I think this was from, sorry, I lost, lost my notes here. Um, Design and teaching of an institution-wide module aimed at helping students and staff understand what is not acceptable conduct. We've really, um, we've really talked about this, but we talk to, um, I talk to a lot of ins different institutions about how what they actually do. And there was um, one that I thought was worth highlighting was Victoria University in Wellington. I think we have somebody here from Victoria University, do we? Um, which is now um, part of Student Voice of Malaysia. And they developed um, three, in um, collaboration with students, they developed three modules and they, in partnership, they will workshop with students before going live. And these were in areas like responding to disclosures, that's the reaction part, boundaries and appropriate conduct and being an active bystander, which is pro-action, which is actually developing a safe campus. Um, Sarah. Mm -hmm. would, you like to, would you like to take over here on these um, ideas yeah. that you have put forward? Yeah, so the first one is establish a student experience panel. Um, and I'm very big on if students are going to contribute in any way, particularly in this field, because it is so taxing. And a lot of people who will be a part of this will have lived experience. So they're also contributing their lived experience as well as their time they should be paid. Um, and there's a whole different ways that you can go about that. Um, but it will allow for students to be able to have a say on policies, reports, reporting methods, things the unis do, um, a whole range of things um, as well. To go to the third point, the Student Advocates Advisory Group. So this is something I started up um, in Newcastle in October of last year. Um, and what it looks like is it's 10 to 12 students um, in the institution and they have lived experience and they meet once a month um, to either reflect on some of the stuff the uni is doing to do work on sexual assault and harassment or to look over trainings and policies. So that's been running um, since then and it's been quite successful so far. We've um, we looked over all of our securities training, what they do training wise, um, where they get their training and then suggested a whole range of new training that we think that needs to be done because they are dealing a lot of the time with um, that first response. I'm just going to have to give you one more one more minute and then we're going to have to move on to the third case study. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So um, that's a really powerful way of doing things because you can reflect um, and give, you know, that really important lived experience uh, through that group. Thanks, Sarah. That's great. Um, incentives for participation. The big point that I think is really important here, we've talked about financial incentives, et cetera, but the really big point is, as Sarah makes, so I should lead you into it, is really it's important that students can see that you're doing things from their that you, your, their voice is being put into practice. Is that Would you like to pick that up just in the last minute, Sarah? Yeah. Um, it's just really important that they, yeah, they, that they're a part of the change um, and that it's not just the institution making the change and then they're a last thought. It needs to be engaged with students, engaged with the experience from the start all the way to the end. And as that last slide said, there's there's a whole way of, way of range of things to do it, like pizza days, gift cards, a whole range of things. Um, yeah, so I think that's pretty much it, but it's just, you know, recognising that we need lived experience um, and we need to be, if we really want to end sexual assault and harassment, we need to be engaging with students. 
That's fantastic. Thanks, Sarah. I should leave it with you having the last point. The, the slides are going to be available and there's a lot of stuff on them. So hopefully there are ideas that you can pick up on um, and work with. And that's my favourite slide for student voice that I use. Should be the way of doing things, not an add-on student voice. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks, Sally. Thank you both so much.